Courage to me is the ability to be honest with self. It's the ability to, to face it head on. And, and one of the most courageous things you can do is ask for help. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, I'm very excited to bring some content to you today to introduce you to a person and also to not just him, but also he and his wife and the work that they're doing. As you know, we talk a lot about faith on this show. Uh, we talk a lot about science and health, um, but we haven't had anyone on the program yet who could really bring all of these things together in terms of physical wellness, um, faith, and how do, how do we connect those two? Uh, how do we connect those two in order to, on the first, uh, in the first place, live our best lives here on earth, but also to conduct ourselves and to take care of ourselves in a way that glorifies our creator and expresses our faith as Christians? Well, today we're honored to have on the program uh, a, a man who is a naturopathic doctor, Dr. Mark Sherwood, and we're going to learn a lot about him, about how, how we do this in a time when really our, our physically and spiritually, uh, we're under attack in ways that we really, in a way that's almost unprecedented. So, uh, Dr. Mark, thanks for being with us today on Great Matter. It's our pleasure to have you as our guest. Oh my goodness, it's my honor to be here. I've been looking forward to this, so uh, I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'll just share with people, um, I'm in my 50s now, and I've been throwing around the weight since I was a teenager. So I'm really excited to have a guy like Mark on, who uh, you know is a real fitness expert. Uh, and so, uh, and I've had the pleasure of reading a couple of the books that he and his wife have written. We're going to talk about those later. But before we get to introduce him properly to you, as we always do, we have our framing aphorisms uh, for the day. And uh, the first is from Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 which reads, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Secondly, from 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 6, say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. John chapter 1, verse 2, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So who do we have on the show today? Well, Mark Sherwood, it's a naturopathic doctor. He and his wife, Michelle, uh, who's a doctor of osteopathy, have a full-time wellness-based medical practice in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, which is called the Functional Medical Institute. This is a really fascinating project that they're involved in. It's quite unique. Their goal is to lead people down a pathway of true healing uh, with two main purposes. The first is to eradicate all self-imposed choice-driven disease conditions, and that's a tall order, and to eliminate the usage of unnecessary medications. Through their unique clinic, various diagnostic tests are used. Healing and prevention of common disease patterns are the norm. And this is, a, as you learn more about it, as I have started to, it's a very multifaceted approach, and their reach is incredible. They're reaching more than 3 million people online each year. So really quite remarkable. And more than that, uh, Mark has even uh, ran for the governorship of uh, Oklahoma. So uh, what an incredible guy we have in the show today. Uh, so um, uh, Dr. Mark, first of all, I'd like to start with perhaps um, if you could share a little bit of the biographical history of you and your wife, uh, obviously very accomplished people, um, and how you your, your sort of path, your, your journey, brought you to where you are right now, where you're sharing uh, this multifaceted health approach with uh, with people in the United States and all over the world? Well, I always look forward to sharing our story, especially my wife's story. Um, she is quite the unique individual. Just very briefly, um, she was homeless at one time and climbed her way out of that to Incredible. become top of her medical school. I mean, who does that, right? And um, <laughs> she was... Um, a massage therapist living in her car, you know, just trying to get by. And uh, anyway, long story short, she ends up getting into uh, medicine 
and they terminate her after a few years because too many people got well and her payer mix wasn't sufficient. And so that was her story. And in mine, I was a police officer at the time and learned that people were dying. And, I, and it wasn't just because of violence. It was something bigger and deeper than that, Leighton. And I, I wanted to figure out why. My brothers and sister officers were not living very long after retirement. So I went on a, a quest, if you will, to figure out why. And I just kept asking why. It's not like Forrest Gump keep, kept running. I just kept studying and asking why, you know, and... And I became a naturopath, and then my wife and I met, and um, it was truly love at first sight. She, I like to refer to her as not just my spare rib, but she's my prime rib. And um, <laughs> we started the Functional Medical Institute with a dream and a vision to, to, to not just change healthcare, but to change the way people view the idea of health and to change the parameters. And we knew that we were going to uh, attack a paradigm that needed to be going, needed to be really shifted in a different direction, which is the culture of this country. And, uh, and it started out with just us and it's, it's amazing how it's grown. And we're really just blessed, man, I, to, to be able to, to help people. And like in the, the, you said in the intro, and this is something that makes me really happy, the reversal and really avoidance of disease processes is something we see every day. It's so normal that it's expected. And frankly, conditions like type 2 diabetes should not even exist in one single person. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that um, is a miraculous about human beings and the way that God made us, he made us in his image, the Imago Dei, is uh, he, he equipped us with just an incredible uh, thing to fight off disease and keep us healthy called the immune system. And and yet it seems to me as uh, someone who is looking at the at the medical profession uh, from the outside, and let's say even beyond that, including in that all aspects of, of uh, let's say, you know, treating sickness uh, from the pharmaceutical industry to on and on and on. Um, it really isn't, it, it, it doesn't seem to recognize what Hippocrates wrote uh, many centuries ago, where he said, you know, let thy food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be thy food, that actually uh, we're equipped with this incredible ability to heal ourselves. Um, but it seems as though, and I'm, I'm interested to get your take on this, I think I know what you're going to say from having read your books. It seems as though the whole doctrine of medical science uh, is set against that. Uh, and and it seems to disregard the the uh, the ability of the, of the of the body to heal itself. Would you is that a fair assessment, or am I going too far? No, I think it's very fair. You look at the way we view this idea of medicine. We call it you know conventional or Western healthcare. It's pretty new when you look at it from the history standpoint. A hundred years, give or take, right? Yeah. And it has been used to profit. It's become profited over people. It's become money over health. And clearly, it has shifted from Hippocrates' concept, which was three thousand years ago: let food be that medicine, and medicine be that food. He also said health begins in the gut, and disease begins in the colon. Boy, that guy was way ahead of his time. <laughs> but I find it ironic that we 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 in the clinician space take this oath that says first do no harm the oath is named after the same guy hippocrates therefore the hippocratic oath but how can you say that you're not doing harm when you fail to give the first medicine which is food so it, it has turned on its head it's not legitimate anymore and the distrust that people have is well earned we're not against medicine but when it's used as the only thing, the only tool you have in your box late, and it's like all you have in your toolbox is a hammer. And if mm -hmm. that's true, then everything must be a nail. And so we have a huge gap in this now. And and it's not worked well. Um, we have the worst healthcare outcomes in the modern world. We spend more money per capita per family than any other industrialized nation. We are an embarrassment literally to the entire world. We allow things into our food supply and we subsidize cheap non-food that's disease causing. We have got the biggest border crisis on our hands and it's not just the structural borders of our country. It is our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our heart, and really the thing that sits below our nose and above our chin, our mouths, what comes in and out. We have got to get a hold of this because if we don't get a hold of this right now, 
I think we're at a dire point, and I really think the enemy that we face every day is within. The person mm. staring at us back in the mirror. Yeah, no, very, very true. Um, you know, Mark, just to share with you, um, I was involved, uh, and I'm still involved, in many COVID-type cases where we went up against the government over things like lockdown restrictions and vaccine mandates. And a couple of years ago, I got to cross-examine uh, a woman who is the chief medical officer of health for Alberta. So she was in charge of all of the lockdowns that occurred in, in Alberta. I don't know what things were like in Oklahoma, but no. uh, during during uh, the pandemic, it was pretty bad up here. And um, she, she was talking about how all of these things were necessary, including vaccines to protect the healthcare system. But I showed her some data under cross-examination that showed a very clear symmetry between obesity and basically every other serious health problem that that is happening in our in our system, including COVID. In fact, eighty percent of the people who are going to hospital with serious COVID systems were obese. Right. But but what is it about the medical establishment in our society that j- just seems to turn a, a blind eye? In fact, we're starting to glorif- glorify obesity, aren't we? Yes, we are. And Leighton, it's sad because the obesity is the fastest growing non-communicable disease in the history of mankind's existence. And you mentioned something very key, and I think people need to know this. This is important. It's not fat shaming people. It, it's not at all. It's not like saying someone is is over fat that makes them shameful or or ugly. That's not the point. This is a health issue. Excess adiposity. That adipose tissue creates inflammatory signals. A virus creates inflammatory signals. A vaccine creates inflammatory signals. Cortisol creates inflammatory signals. And so when you have a system that's already inflamed substantially and undernourished, meaning we take in a lot of these high calorie, non-nutritious foods, remember our system is driven by the ability to sort of receive and transport these micronutrients down to the cellular level so that the mitochondria can actually create energy for the cells to generate in whatever organ systems they construct. Now, with that said, if we eat nutrient-dense, nutrient-poor food, the cells don't operate. We are going to gain weight because the body's trying to find something in the middle of the mess. So really, this weight gain we have is really a malnutrition kind of concept and it's bent on destruction of the human being. So I'm not surprised. We know that um, obesity, you know, is is so normalized right now. I mean, people like my wife and I, and we were talking about this before going live here, you know, we're looked at as freaks, as weirdos, as radicals, as hardcore. But to me, getting up to exercise every day and lifting weights and uh, eating right, sleeping right, de-stressing and I don't think that's hardcore at all. I think it should be the norm. And, and I, it's just, a, it's a weird world we live in where we're all of our angles of communication and propaganda is bent towards alleviating self-responsibility. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, I'm looking for a doctor now to fix me. I'm looking for a pastor to fix me. I'm looking for a trainer to fix me. What about what I have to do? You know, look in the mirror. What do I have to do? And you, I love the scripture you mentioned when you opened in Proverbs. It is not something that's just good word. It's the truth. You know, when you have a lot of cortisol going on, you get this acidic nature. The bones begin to leach calcium and it does rot the bones right? Osteoporosis. So we've got to understand that the principles we live by are are biblically based. And if we bring it back to that point and become principally driven instead of profit driven, I think we'll be better off in the long term. Mm -hmm. And this is a big part of what you and your wife do, isn't it? Um, Focusing on introducing people uh, to a different way of looking at not only health, but the, the broader concept of wellness. And, you know, we forget, uh, when I say we, not you, <laughs> other people forget um, that wellness is not just a physical con- concept, is it? And this is a big part of what you and your wife teach is uh, it's important to connect with spiritual wellness because you can be physically healthy, and if you're, but if you're spiritually sick, you, you aren't well. 
so a big part of what you're doing, as I understand it, is you're trying to connect these different things for people so that they appreciate why they're exercising, why they're eating right, because they're not only feeding their bodies, they're feeding them, themselves spiritually. Is that, is that a, am I on the right line? You are. Um, mankind's existence is really, I mean, if we're going to simplify it, it's physical, emotional, spiritual, right? You cannot separate those things. We are a physical being that has emotions that really are a spirit. So all those things are interconnected. It's almost like, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's all one. And it's fascinating because people try to separate those. And it's, mm -hmm. and I'll use just practical examples. We try to go to the doctor to fix us physically. We go to the counselor to fix us emotionally. And we go to the pastor to fix us spiritually. And we've got to ask the question at this point, how well is that working for us? It's not. Mm -hmm. And so you can't separate, Leighton, what is inseparable. Because if you try to separate what is inseparable, it's going to bring confusion. It's going to bring anxiety. And it's going to bring dis-ease. Mm -hmm. But when you bring them back together, you get harmony back. And, and I think everybody ought to understand that if you have emotional pressures that are driven by relational issues, driven by financial issues, you're going to have physical issues. And if you have physical issues, it becomes a distraction from what you might want to be spiritually. And if you have spiritually confusing issues, it's going to affect you physically and emotionally. And I find that people leave out most of the time in my experience, they leave out the physical piece. They think, mm -hmm. you know, that's just going to happen. But I have found the opposite to be true, that when you put this together, physical, emotional, spiritual, do something intentional every day to just improve yourself. And I'm not talking just, extraordinary things. I'm talking an intentional mindset to do something positive to improve in those areas, wherever you are every day. Life, though as hard as it is, becomes more bearable and you become more resilient in life. And as you correctly mentioned, people today are suffering like they've never suffered before. And mm -hmm. I'm not trying to bring more life or more years in life, but I'm trying to bring more life in the years. And, right. and I really, really believe that the potential mankind has is underutilized, underappreciated and under addressed because what my wife and I are talking about is a concept that's not what we view as typical healthcare. We're, you mentioned wellness. Wellness to me is being able to do what you want, when you want, how you want, as often as you want, not hurt. It's right. being able to live younger, older, maybe even die younger, older. It's being able to live in the opposite of this inverse bell curve. You know, you get up and you you earn your money and then you have this last 10 years that's just full of medication to six span, right? Yeah. But I, I like life like a rectangle. I'm born, I live, and then I change addresses, you know? And it's <laughs> it's that simple. And I think that if we get back to that and and incorporate some of the principles we're talking about, and, and sadly, there's not a lot of people doing this out there. We we don't have colleagues, but um, yeah. it is what it is. I just hope that maybe this inspires people to do something better. Well, it certainly inspires me. And, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, living out your your years in a worthwhile way, one example, I once read a biography of Michelangelo, the great sculptor and painter. And the way he died, he was 91 years old and they found him in his studio he had uh, you know, his chisel in his hand. Uh, he was wearing nothing but a, a loincloth. He was 91 years old and he was ripped because he worked all day on stone. And that's how he died. He died doing, he, he died creating the works of art that God had revealed to him that he would etched in stone for all time. To me, that's, that's the way, that's the way to go out. Right. Uh, but you know, to, today that picture looks a lot different. And, and also I find that people today are worrying more about illness, worrying more about death. Um, because we live in a society where every day you can't even turn on the television without seeing some commercial that says, right. got, you know, go get Revitalin or something else. Go ask your doctor about, <laughs> about this. Um, so we're really, we're making people, uh, we're actually counseling people, teaching people to be sick, to live a life of, of basically of chronic illness. And whereas you and your wife are out there and you're trying to to get a different uh, a, a picture entirely in their minds, is that kind of what neuropathic medicine is all about? 
And I wonder if you could give us an ex explanation of really what it is that you do and how it's different from how an ND is different from an MD. Yeah, there's quite a difference. The idea of medical doctors today, the way they're trained, people need to know that they're not bad people, but the training is meant and funded by big pharma. So that just needs to sit in and soak in for a moment. Yeah. But medical doctor is trained to when you come in as a patient and you quote unquote present with a group of symptoms, the symptoms are then put into an algorithm, an algorithm of thinking that says if these symptoms are here, I go to this group of medicines and I'm going to quote unquote, try this medicine. And the medicine is not designed to be anything other than alleviate, remediate, or stop your symptoms. Okay. Now, sometimes that's necessary, but we look at it differently. I look at a system when someone comes in and they present with these symptoms, I'm like, okay, great. But I want to know what caused them, what led to them. I'm not looking to identify or diagnose a disease. I'm not trying to become a master diagnostician. I'm trying to become a master healer, you know, and I'm looking at the person and I'm saying, okay, why are these symptoms occurring? So I go way back upstream. I look at all aspects of life. I look at their food. I look at their sleep. I look at their stress management. I look at their movement. I ask them about their relational health, their business health, their spiritual health their emotional health, where they are in life, the timing they're in life. And I, I look at all that and genetics. Genetics tell us a big old story. So I'm looking at that pattern and I'm trying to figure out where the harmonious concept or the ease of their life got off course. Mm. And when we can do that, we bring back to, you know, this harmonious state upstream. We alleviate the cause of these symptoms, the symptoms go away and therefore disease becomes irrelevant. Today, we have the great distraction. The greatest distraction of us being able to achieve is death, disease, destruction, and lack. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a moment. When we're always focused on those things, it's all about fear and anxiety, isn't it? And yes. fear and anxiety drives cortisol, and cortisol drives obesity. Obesity drives inflammation, and inflammation is a part of every single disease process. So when I look at a person, I'm looking at them kind of in a 4D, if you will, pattern. And I want to know what it is that makes them up. And I, I look at it like this. I try to put the corner pieces together and the border pieces of the puzzle that is like latent gray. And then once we get that done through genetics and so maybe some downstream testing, then we start putting the pieces in the center to create the best picture of that person. So they can begin to see that they can have vision and we test the proper things. I like measurables. Measurables mm -hmm. are motivators and the right measurables motivate. And I want people to know that their best self is not just a far fetched pipe dream. It's very, very attainable. And we continue to go back to that every single encounter. And the person eventually gets the vision that they can do this. And that vision then becomes a reality. And wellness mm. becomes part of who they are. Mm. Fascinating. You know, um, one of that, that makes me think of actually um, something that, uh, that I heard Dr. Fauci say, sort of at the height of the pandemic, uh, where he said, he said, I am science. Yeah. And um, when I heard that, it sort of struck me. It, was, it made me mm. think of what Christ said to Pilate, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I am truth. And um, part of the problem that we, we have developed in Western, in Western society, places like the United States and Canada, mm -hmm. is we've made a false idol of science. Yes. Um, and um, we're not looking at the spiritual part of of life as as truth we've we've supplanted the real truth the spiritual truth that's revealed to us in the bible uh for this the scientific truth that's offered by people like fauci mm -hmm. and it's false and it's uh it it, it makes us sick it, it leads to pain and suffering and sadly uh death um so how do you and uh and your wife help people connect with their best spiritual selves in addition to their their physical well-being how do you connect those dots? Well, we've actually had a lot of people come in and use the phrase, what does the science say? Or that 
thing we heard, trust the science. And I remind yeah. them clearly that, you know, science, that was a misdef, misdefined term because science is really what you have left over after you pull holes in it. It's like <laughs> you're questioning, questioning. And, yeah. and we are designed to seek truth. Yeah. I don't understand all truth, but I know who does. And I can, I encourage people to seek, 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 keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. When I talk about the spiritual self of people, I, I don't mind looking them in the eyes and asking them pointed questions. Are you at peace? You know, mm. how, how do you feel about life? Get, and, and I, I want to get to know them because if, if you can listen to a person as they communicate their heart, the heart is really what defines a person. You can really get in there. And then when you when they open that up, there's an opportunity there to introduce someone who can fill the void. And mm -hmm. we know that's the concept of God. That mm -hmm. We are all born with this absenteeism, if you will, in the heart. And there's only one way to fill that. And if you don't feel that, this is the problem with the world. We're, we're seeking a mankind solution for a God-sized issue. We're seeking to fill the heart with mankind's remedies when God's the only answer. And if you don't have peace in your heart, you only have chaos left. Yeah. So the world is going to become increasingly violent. People are going to become increasingly violent because it's the natural response to a lack of peace. You know, mm -hmm. the whole thing we see in the world of just the ungodly, unthinkable things that were once unacceptable, horribly, immorally, just never going to accept those. They're now becoming the norm mm -hmm. because it is a world that is not being led by people that are seeking truth. It's a world now that's being led by people that are seeking fame, fortune, and power and influence, which is a great enticer, no question. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can see how it, the, 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 the toggle switch goes back and forth, but we, we go there with people. And, and frankly, it's interesting. You would think that um, people that don't believe in God would not gravitate to us, but it's just the opposite. Yeah. People that are looking and seeking, they don't know what they're looking for. They're just looking and, mm -hmm. and they, they show up, they call, they look us up and we end up connecting with them. The ones that we have trouble helping are the ones, like Jesus said, that think they're well. And that yeah. becomes the hyper religious folks, the ones that don't think they need to do all this physical stuff. My heart breaks for them. Mm -hmm. you know, many, many days because of that. So, you know, it's, it's really an interesting journey we've been on and all the lessons we've learned, but um, there, there is that connection there that's inseparable. Yeah. So um, you and your wife, you, you've, you've got this, uh, this concept that's designed to, to help people really get healthy in every way. Um how if someone wants to get involved and they're listening to this and they're going, wow, this man, Mark and Michelle, they sound great. I really want to be part of this. I want to learn about this. Um, it is possible for them to get involved and to access the, 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 you know, the type of services that you provide, the type of knowledge you provide remotely. Right. In fact, you're providing over 3 million people a year are, are getting, are, are connecting with you. So how does that work? How do you manage all that? Well, with God, because <laughs> it's a lot of folks, but no, no kidding. Um, we actually do um, a free webinar, believe it or not, every single month. And um, it's my wife and I, people need to know that it's not some surrogate we have and or, or some person we've hired. It's us. We really get, we've got a staff, but I'm not going to be a hypocrite as a leader. If yeah. I'm going to lead, I'm going to live it. If I'm going to lead, I'm not going to be somebody who stands behind a camera and just sells stuff. Yeah. No, I, I've got to teach people and my wife, do we hold that free webinar and people can connect with us. They can ask us questions remotely. And if, if they want to schedule a consult with us, they can. We can get blood work done pretty much all over, you know, the United States. And it's mm -hmm. really cool. We can work with people. We work people in Canada before. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing because there's no separation now with the, the wonderful computer systems we have. So um, the thing that we know that, COVID did in a positive way is it opened the whole world. It opened people's thinking. So I, I look at it, I looked at it as a big old blessing in a way. And so people can reach out to us, of course, at Sherwood.tv and 
all the things that we do there, there's a lot of free stuff too. So, you know, we're yeah. givers. I've learned that principle <laughs> a long time ago too. You, you can't out, out give God, you know, so yeah. we're, we're going to continue to give and help people. And, um, it's, it's been an, a, a miraculous journey seeing how mm-hmm. it's uh, spread word of mouth like this. Right. You, uh, you speak in your website about something called real transformation. Yeah. Uh, being within people's reach and uh, a three-step sort of path to success. And uh, we have to be careful here because this is not self-help. Self-help is is really, I, I mean, I don't know what your opinion is, Mark, but I find it's a it's it's almost a fraudulent product. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the focus on on trying to become your best self by by focusing on the on the self uh, is almost a deception. You know, you can fall into self-worship. And, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about putting people on a path, giving them the knowledge and the tools and the habits where they can really, really discover wh- who, who they can become, right? Maybe the best, their, their best self, the best example of, of how God created them and who God created them to be. That's my impression of this three-step process. But do you want to talk about how that process works? Yeah, I, I can give people a practical example. You know, it's not about you know, over loving self. It's really about uh, learning how to love self so you can love others better. That's kind yeah. of what it is. And and so I, I use the analogy of, of, of loving God first, upward, yeah. then allowing him to love you inward so that you can love outward. Yeah. And, and if we get any of those things disjointed, it gets out of order. Mm-hmm. And so people need to take action. They need to commit to the processes of learning the principles and and principles that are not mine they're they've been around since the beginning of time and they work and so right. the the principles that you follow then Leighton, you you know by fixing nutrition and sleep and stress management and movement and then uh, allowing them to learn their genetics and what that means that becomes very empowering you know and and then the the testing that we do and the encouraging we give, it allows them to work through that process to really learn um, how to love their self again, not in an unhealthy way, but in a way to love others better. So it's really an outward approach, you know, Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. everybody wants to be able to have their best life. But if we can shift that to become a life that has a deep well that can give more, that's how the world becomes a better place. That's how we become Mm -hmm. better fathers, Mm -hmm. better mothers, better sons and daughters and leaders. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could talk a little bit in specifics here because, uh, and I realize, you know, you can't sort of get to everything in in one hour, but just, just uh, maybe some key points. I noticed on your website, you, you actually point to a few that impact a lot of people. One of them is how alcohol causes uh, nutrient deficiencies and hurts the body. I mean, most people realize, you know, alcohol is not good for you. But they, they don't understand fully why. What what is it about alcohol that is so a uh, nutrient deficient for the you know for the body? Well, let's just go back to you know what is alcohol? It, it is a toxin, right? It's not a natural thing to the body. The body's not made of alcohol. So, anytime you bring a toxin in, the body's detox process, as God intended, is activated. Now, mm-hmm. when you have the activation of the detox process, there's really three phases. One is I'll simplify this recognition of the toxin. That's important. So your body recognizes that and it initiates a whole bunch of enzymes that begin to try to transform this toxin into a form that can be eliminated. And the second phase is when the body gets it to a form that can be eliminated, it sort of claws onto it with a compound inside. That's just the conjugation stage, the joining stage, like a, like a bouncer in a bar may grab the person who's causing a problem, boom, Mm -hmm. phase three is elimination. When you bring in alcohol, it does several things to the body. First, it's a toxin. So it triggers the detox system. The toxins get delivered through that system. And when they get eliminated, they go out through alcohol does through the urine. Boom, boom, boom. So it turns up the detox pathways, which will turn up the the urination, which will continue to deplete the nutrients every time the detox pathway is activated, it requires nutrients. So you get it from both sides. You get the nutrient depletion from the chronic activation of the pathway, but then 
you activate this pathway so hard, you get the nutrients depleted because your body's always getting rid of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's both directional. And then there's a third part that really I don't think people think about too much. If you can't get it out of your body effectively, Mm. the toxins are mostly lipophilic, meaning they store in fat tissue. They love fat. And so they begin to store in the visceral area. That's right, right around the organs. And so we end up getting this belly fat and that Mm. is toxic milieu right around your organs. And obviously back to our point, inflammation is, is what's happening at that point. So it's, it's a whole set of circumstances. It's not just having a, a glass of wine. It's understanding the process of the body dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I discovered, um, several years ago, about, uh, about 12 years ago, I hadn't had a drink in a long time. And I took, I had had a, a glass, a couple of glasses of wine. And because I hadn't, had consumed alcohol for so long, I I realized immediately, wow, this doesn't make me feel good. It no. almost makes me feel tired and sick. And and so I gave up alcohol entirely. I don't drink at all, but I know I mentioned it here because many people, you know, they they struggle with alcohol um, mm-hmm. as as an addiction. And so it's really important that they understand you, you know, how bad it is for them. Um, another thing, a couple of things about eating that I think I'd like to you to touch on, because these are really important, I think affect a lot of people. One is, um, how do you, how do you satisfy, uh, the relationship? A lot of people will overeat and will eat excessively Mm -hmm. because they connect an emotional need with eating. Um, and this is probably something you run into a lot in your practice. How do, how do, how do people, how, how do you help people overcome that type of a problem? We need to understand from a root cause late and where it came from. And most of it started as a child. And mm-hmm. we as parents need to get this. And so little Johnny, we'll use little Johnny's example. Little Johnny um, is riding his bike and falls down and skins his leg. He gets a little bit of uh, road rash, let's call it, right? And little Johnny is comforted with an ice cream. Little Johnny then goes to school. He joins a sports team. And they have a big victory and they celebrate with an ice cream. But then they had their first big loss and they consoled themselves with an ice cream. <laughs> Little Johnny goes to second grade and gets promoted. And so they celebrate the occasion with an ice cream. All of the emotions, pain, consolation, victory, dealing with loss and grief are all comforted with a drug that mm-hmm. drives dopamine. So, we learn that as a child and those memories get planted back in our hypothalamus and they, they, they get stuck there in our brain. And so as we get older, all we know is how to find comfort by what we've taught. And it, the body remembers that over the course of time. Now, comfort food, as we know, is typically high sugar, which drives dopamine. And then it has a lot of the breads and grains and even dairy that are actually constructed today to drive the morphine pathway. They're the opioid pathway. It's called exorphin. And so we get this comfort food, this feeling of calm. But the problem with those things is they do drive obesity Mm -hmm. because they convert to blood sugar quickly. And then insulin is secreted from the pancreas. And there you've got your fat storing inflammatory convergence coming together. And so it has to be broken. The idea of our taste is not something we're born with. It's something we're taught as evidenced by other countries. And you've probably been around other countries as I have too. There are things people eat and I'm like, how do they like that? But they've learned to like the taste. We have to begin to stop looking at food as our best friend. Now, one more point to that that's really important. Because we haven't dealt with this appropriately, and because people are so relationally bankrupt with themselves, the best friend they have sometime is a bag of chips. Because that bag of chips will not talk back to them. It will be obedient to them. It will never criticize them. It will always be there for them. And it will always give them as much as they want. But it's a trap. So all that said, this is the society we live in where a lot of these foods that I just mentioned are subsidized by governmental authorities to make them cheap, to make them available under the auspices of this 
is the best we can do. On mm-hmm. the flip side, if you bring in fruits and vegetables and food the way God constructed it, you won't get those dopaminergic opioid-like reactions, and you won't have that response. So it's it's got to be trained out of somebody by understanding why they have it, giving them permission to really recognize that, that it's not their fault. They become a victim of it, and then give them another option out of it. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. I, I saw a study recently about the Japanese uh, who uh, have, I think they are the, they have the the greatest longevity mm-hmm. of any nation in the world, even though they have, they're very high in tobacco use still. Yeah. Uh, but they have very low incidence of alcoholism and obesity. I wonder if there's a connection there. It sounds like from listening to you that there might be. Um, yeah. Speaking, one other thing about uh, food and one of the solutions that uh, you, you talk about on the website is this concept of intermittent fasting that I find very intriguing, uh, but don't fully understand. Um, how can intermittent fasting, uh, help people learn to, to manage their eating habits in a way that's more healthy for them and their bodies? We first go back to our genetics that has changed 2% in 10,000 years. That's it. So if the genetics have changed 2% in 10,000 years, that means that just reasonably speaking, Leighton, that we would be hunter gatherers by nature, which would mean that again, reason, logic, that we probably wouldn't have food available at our whim every time we want. And certainly it would be seasonal. So you wouldn't be able to run to the grocery store. So we are never and were never designed to have this small, frequent consumption of meals all the time. We were meant, genetically speaking, to have bouts of not food available. So that's one thing to understand. Secondarily, and this is very important, there's a pathway out there called mTOR, little m, capital T-O-R, mammalian target of rapamycin. People can look that up. And the opposite of the mTOR pathway is called autophagy, Mm A-U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y. mTOR is a builder or constructor. Autophagy is the salvaging pathway. When we have food in our belly, no matter what it is, the body is always in the construction phase because it has to look at what's in the belly and says, hey, there's something there that's material that I have to sort through and sift through to see what I can use. Because keeping Mm -hmm. in mind, our mouth is the open place to the environment. We bring something into our environment. It's like something crossing the border. You better figure out what it is before it becomes a problem. So the body looks at all of that and determines that. So mTOR is activated. So mTOR constructs proteins and lipids and uh, even DNA. So it's always building. The body cannot deal with viruses and clean up and salvage and just, just, just help out with cell repair or cell destruction necessarily like autophagy if it's in a fed state. Mm. That's a very important thing. So intermittent fasting then or defined as times we don't have food in our belly. We have an empty stomach, empty chamber. The body then has the ability to shift its resources to go around and look at different cells, different uh, viruses, bacteria that may or may not be harmful, and it deals with them effectively. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest things people can do when they have like a, a virus or something like that is fast. One of the greatest things people do when they have a cancer is fast. And you you hear this talk all the time, but that type of treatment is not really done in North America much anymore, but it does work because it makes sense from Mm -hmm. the pathways that I just explained to you. Yeah. I, I, I've done uh, the longest fast I've done was about 11, 12 days. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I don't think I've ever felt better. Yeah. Um, For anyone who's tried this, they'll identify with this. There's a feeling of freedom. Uh, yeah, you know, you almost feel like you're, you're not because you stop thinking about food and eating all the time. And I find, I found that my mind was sharper. I found that I slept better. Um, just not having something in your body and your body, not having to expend that energy on, on, on digestion. Uh, it was a very freeing experience and it's a very nice experience. Uh, uh, but, but it, of course this is very, very against, uh, you know, North American thinking, isn't it? It really is. But um, keeping in mind, the body cannot repair, regenerate, rebuild, restore if it's in a fed state. It can only do that when it's in a fasted, rested state. 
you go back to the concept of sleep. Why is sleep so beneficial? It's not because you're not awake. As much as it is, you're in a fasted, rested, relaxed state. The body can go mm -hmm. around and clean itself and heal itself. Great for brain health. You mentioned this key thing about, you know, thinking better, being more free. It frees us up to deal with self. You know, our body can then begin to do what it's supposed to do. I think of, you know, Jesus fasting for 40 days. I mean, I think, wow. Yeah, that was a long time. I've never done that. And and the interesting thing about that was the very first temptation was food. Bread, yeah. See, he, it's interesting, didn't fall for that, but Adam and Eve did. You know, so <laughs> this is the biggest thing we need to catch today. I think that it's the greatest attack we've had, which is the relationship we have with food, with our bodies, with the earth, that we're not catching. We're not getting it and it's destroying us on a daily basis. And wow. my wife and I are like uh, a little bit unusual out there. And, um, but I'm, I'm confident with a hundred percent certainty that it's true. And yeah. the more I look at it, the more I get into it and the more people I see get free, um, late and that's rewarding and it makes me happy, but it, it also, it drives me harder because I want more people to be free. Yes. Yes. So that's a big part of uh, what you're doing is, is the concept of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and, but freedom in, in, the, in, a, in a true sense, in terms of being free of, of bondage, uh, you know, the bondage yeah. of, of sin, because really all the terrible things that we do to our bodies, we do to ourselves uh, are sinful. They, they are fundamentally sin. God doesn't want us to to hurt ourselves, to do harm ourselves. We're doing the devil's work when we do that. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's something that is important to realize, but I love the way you put that together. Uh, that's, uh, I, I never quite made that connection between, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, and, and, and the 40 days in the wilderness and then the three temptations yeah. and tracing that back to, to Adam and Eve, because there's a connection there. Cause of course, what God says to, to the devil is, you know, uh, your your head will be crushed by the seed. And then, of course, uh, there's that other connection. So, yeah, that's great the way you put that together. Um, you talk on the website uh, about um, 11 questions to ask yourself about courage. And this seems to me is something really important in terms of your, your yeah. teaching and your philosophy, even your theology, if we can call it that. And, and I, don't, I, I doubt that embarrasses you for me to say that. Really, this is part of well, you know, you're, you're, what you're doing is really fundamentally, it's, it's a biblical teaching. But what are these 11 questions? Or, or can you give us maybe the top three, the most important ones? Yeah, you know, when I look at this whole idea of, of courage, courage to me is the ability to be honest with self. It's the ability to, to face it head on. And, and one of the most courageous things you can do is ask for help. And mm -hmm. you, you, you know, just to say, I need some help to, to be a leader, Layton, to step out there, even though it might not be the popular thing to do, I would rather step out there alone than be in a group in the wrong. So these questions we ask ourselves about leaders, are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to go the road less traveled? Are we willing to take the heat for somebody? Are we willing to stand the gap for the benefit of mankind? Are we willing to interpose on behalf of other people? Th these are important. And they are essential for really the, the growth of mankind's ability to go forward. And I think they're essential for us as humans to get the fullest of, of God's courage put in us because he wants us to stand up. I mean, you mentioned, I think, you know, Christ is the greatest example of courage that I know. Yeah. But his courage was, was built because of an intense love for everybody else. It wasn't trying to bring attention to self. It was trying to bring attention to the source that gave him the courage and trying to give other people that same courage. And and that's exactly what we try to instill in every single person we deal with, whether it be a, a, a patient we're dealing with, you know, 3,000 miles away or, or an interview like this. I mean, I really passionately, this is who we are. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really put everything we got into it. My wife did the same thing because life is too short, too unpredictable to waste these now moments. You know, I look at, I don't know about tomorrow. I can't tell you that's, that's a mystery. 
Um, mm-hmm. Yesterday, well, as we say, that's history. <laughs> but today is a gift. Yeah. That's why it's called the present. And I, I look at it like that, and I want to make sure that every encounter I have is is hardcore questions to drive pull out of someone the true um, recipe of courage that I believe is really, really there inside of all mm-hmm. of us. Mm-hmm. And and you're spreading that message uh, not only through your website, but also through uh, a tour, the Reawaken America tour. Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, uh, the Reawaken America tour started actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, way back in 2021 in the spring. And, um, you know, a, a gentleman named Clay Clark had, a, had an idea at that point to um, to bring about a greater perspective of, of information to give people the ability to make a decision, not just trust the science, you know, to say, Hey, there's other things out here. We want you to be informed. And it started off like that. And, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of that even before it started. And I've been a part of every one of those things. And, and honestly, um, there's been speakers come and go and people can criticize that thing a lot and they do fine, whatever. But all I know is this, and I've seen it happen every time. God is glorified, mankind's encouraged, and people are challenged. Mm-hmm. And I think those things are always good in every situation. And as for me, I don't have any care in the world. It's not my business what anybody else says or does. I have one person to answer to, and and I'm going to honor that person. That's God. And then I'm going to respect my wife. So, um it's we go out there and we're broadcasting the same message and um we've been a part of those things for the last you know three years and uh mm-hmm. i never would have saw that possible but it's it's allowed us to see a good part of the u.s and uh and and meet a lot of cool people and um mm-hmm. and see them get some the little twinkle of hope man is is really cool when you see that they they get the idea somebody's really here to help me you mm-hmm. really care and late man, that's a that's a good feeling, you know, because you yeah. know that they've been looking, mm-hmm. and they're frustrated, and they're tired, and they find something that they can have some hope in, and that is really really cool about that tour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks uh, very very interesting. If people want to find out more about it, I suggest that you visit their their website. Uh, we're going to provide those links later. Mark, I forgot to ask you about one thing when we were talking a little bit earlier about the specific health issues. One thing that seems to be an epidemic, especially in North America, is particular to men. Uh, There's this drastic drop in testosterone levels in men over the past uh, 20 and 40 years. Men nowadays have uh, much, much lower testosterone levels on average than they had even back in the 1980s. Yeah, And this has a whole panoply of health effects for men uh, all through uh, and from from how they feel physically to their energy to disease all the way through. What's what's causing this uh, this this these massive drops in testosterone and and what can uh, what can men do, especially, you know, those of us who are, let's say, north of 40. <laughs> Uh, what what can we do to main, to make sure that we maintain healthy testosterone levels naturally? Yeah, it's interesting because there's a lot of contributors to the the massive trends of lower testosterone in men. I'm not; it's not unusual for us to see men in their low 30s right now that have testosterone really in the 200s, which is terrible. Um, yeah. And it has dropped statistically, you know, 500 you know points uh, per capita per age group as it did back in the 70s and 80s. There are several contributors that goes back to some like, well, that's a no brainer, but some are like underlying. For example, there's a lot of estrogenic compounds in our food supply, estrogenic compounds that are um, uh, synonymous with things that drive estrogen or drive fat tissue. Some of those things are found in like those grains. We use this concept called Roundup to spray these crops. Roundup has an estrogenic compound called atrazine. It Mm. also has um, a carcinogenic compound called glyphosate. Um, we have estrogen in some city waters that's not filtered out because the waters don't filter all the drugs. So we have in one hand, we have these estrogenic compounds in the water, but we also have statin drugs. Statin drugs su- suppress cholesterol, which is the master 
construction piece of hormones. So we had those chemical things going on. And then we had the obesity crisis. Obesity drives more of this enzyme called aromatase, which is found in fat tissue. So the more fat tissue you have, the more aromatase you have. Aromatase converts testosterone into estrogen. Mm. So you have all these factors going on, and then you have stress. Stress drives cortisol. Cortisol is known as a glucocorticoid. It drives glucose, which drives insulin, which drives fat storage. And so the beat goes on. And men need to understand that they, when their testosterone goes low, risk for brain, bone, heart disease goes way up. Same for women too, by the way. Mm -hmm. But the point is, when you get to the point, if you got to this point where the andropausal curve or the pausing of your androgen production starts to go down, there's a point in time where you, you need to look at perhaps some replacement. In the mm. meantime, you need to look at sort of remediating all those things, eating better and detoxing and all that, losing fat tissue and working out more, which will all help you. And then there's some natural things you can do, such as zinc, um, such as LG-150. Um, some of these things can help drive, you know, like uh, tribulus terrestris can help drive testosterone a little bit. You're not going to get it to go up to where it was, but it can sort of keep it out of the tank. So mm -hmm. it is multifactorial and we deal with that all the time. And it's something that's not talked about too much and not to be funny, but this is the truth. We need more men's men out there, yeah. not more soy boys. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be funny, but that's exactly what we have. Yeah. We need men's men who know how to lead, who know how to serve the same time. And you don't do that without testosterone. Yeah. No, I'm I'm so glad that uh, I asked you about that because uh, that, that's a that's a great explanation uh, that provides a lot of information in a sort of a, in a tight package. Well, I want to turn uh, next. We kept you for a while, uh, Doctor Mark. I know you're very busy. Grateful for your time, but I want to talk to you about some of these wonderful books that you and your wife have produced. Uh, the first one is a book that uh, you wrote together called "The Quest for Wellness." a practical and personal wellness plan for optimum health in your body, mind, emotions, and spirit. Um, I wonder if we could, uh, it's described in, in, uh, as a guided journey where the destination is a restored life filled with more energy, strength, focus, and peace, a life you used to know and enjoy when you were younger. So what's the focus of, of, of this book and what will people learn by reading it? Well, that book was our, our first bestseller, and um, it really goes down to the basic premises of, of life, being constructed of physical, emotional, spiritual, intellectual concepts. And you can't separate those. We talked about that. You know, they're inseparable. And so it really does give people the encouragement and the pattern and some tips to practically do something every single day in all those areas. Mm -hmm. And it, little fun tips that we do, like you, you don't have to eat perfectly. That's not the point. You have to begin by one meal. You, you want to begin to learn something new every day intellectually. Read something encouraging that drives your spirit in a, in a good way. And mm -hmm. certainly work on just getting a little more sleep, you know, and things like that. These, these pieces of intentionality, that book is for everybody. Wherever you are in your health journey, there's always something we can do better. And, and we wrote that book to be a handbook of life, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. So everybody that laid their hands on that could could get something positive out of it to give them that the freedom from the bondage of distractions of sickness, disease, and death. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed reading that one. I learned a lot. Uh, the second one has kind of a, a clever title. Yeah. It's called Survive in the Garden of Eaton. <laughs> yeah. These uh, donuts hanging from the tree. Uh, <laughs> but this one is more focused on um, on on healthy eating, right? It is. Um, I'll go back to the idea that leaving the cover, it was meant to be a kind of a joke, but it gets people thinking, you know, uh, we hear this thing called donut ministries in some of the church circles and there is no such thing. You know, I happened to ask the, the, the person that made the garden of Eden, if there was any donuts there and he flat out said no. <laughs> and so, you know, mankind's creation of uh, food is a distortion of God, God's creation of food. Mankind trying to do it better and make it more processed is really trying to do God from his natural production. So, you know, we have got to get out of the, the, the mode of dependent upon this man-made food 
and the Garden of Eton is really the opposite of the Garden of Eden. Eden is about peace and calm and, and, and life to abundance. But when we're focusing on the food all the time, the food becomes our God. And I find it ironic, not that Satan used food to get mankind off course. He, he did it with Adam. It didn't work with Jesus. So he's still trying his number one tactic today on every single person. And so if we just realize that, master that, we cannot just survive the Garden of Eden, but we can live right. life in a more Eden-like manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, not be slaves to our to our bodies. No. Oh. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the third book, which is has more of a spiritual focus, focus is called The Narrow Road um, yep. and Daily Infusions of Hope. Um, I haven't yet read this one. I'm looking forward to reading this book, but from the description, it sounds like uh, you know you're you're focusing on daily devotionals, things that yep. will uh, get people started in their day. And speaking personally, um, one thing that that I do, I spend about the first my first hour of the day. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is spending time in the Word with daily devotionals. Um, this is something that for people who have not discovered this. Um, it's one of the best things you can do for yourself. It just yeah. frames your, your whole day. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just so important. I, I, I started doing it not too long ago and I regret that I haven't been doing this, you know, all my life because it's made such a difference, uh, in my, in, in my spiritual health and my mental health doing this. Yeah. And so this book seems to be kind of along that, those lines, trying to, take some of the fear away, some of the anxiety away and get people focused on, on thoughts and feelings that will um, inspire them through, through, through their day. Is that kind of the idea with this book? It is my wife and I just uh, that's, those are just little things that we wrote from our heart, you know, in our own struggles. And I, I think people will have relatable points or points of understanding with us in that, you know, whoever you are, you're going to have stuff you go through. So that's just, that was our way of, of in these little, they're probably going to take a person five minutes to read these little things. And there's 125 or 30 in there. And, and it's just five minutes of a reflection of what we might go through, the emotions we might feel, the things we might go through. And then finally, some scriptural, re scriptural references to help us deal with that. So it's really my wife and I just let it all hang out from our heart and, that book is has got our hearts and souls into it because it's just us bearing those things mm -hmm. for the world. And and I, I hope that really is a book that gives people that little beginning of the day with an encouragement. And because it you start the day off in that way, and I honor what you say because it's so true. If you start the day off in that way, it's got a chance to be better. But if you start the day off in the opposite of that, it's got a whole lot more chance to not turn out as good as you want. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, sort of a concept of, of framing, you know, of yeah. framing, framing your day, you know, um, if, you, if you were going to build a house, well, you, you start with the frame and try right. And if you're going to build your day, you got to frame your day and you got a better chance of having a good mm -hmm. day. If you put just to have some structure to it, especially if it's the kind of structure that comes from daily devotionals. Well, Dr. Mark, this has just been a wonderful hour. I knew it would be. The only oh. thing that could have made it better is if you would have had your wife here with you. And I hope, <laughs> yeah. I hope that at some point yeah. we can have the two of you on on yeah. the program to talk more because obviously we've only scratched the surface of what you and your wife are doing and what really is a ministry that you're yeah. that you're that you're pursuing. It's it's not just um, you know you know health and fitness. Uh, it really is a type of ministry that you're doing. You're doing you're doing God's work. And to me, that's the definition of a ministry. You're doing God's work. So uh, God bless you for doing that. And uh, we're so very grateful to have had the chance to meet you here today, to introduce you to our audience. And uh, so thank you for being our, our special guest here on Gray Matter. It's been our great pleasure to have you. Well, it's been an honor. I've enjoyed the conversation. and uh, look forward to coming back with my with my queen my uh, my prime rib and uh, <laughs> honestly this has been great i appreciate your heart i appreciate the audience and appreciate what you do so i couldn't be more blessed and humbled and honored to be with you thank you